Hello and welcome to the session in which we will start chapter 10. Chapter 10 talks about making capital investment decisions. So in this chapter, we're going to be dealing with cash flow. But before we start with crunching numbers, what we're going to do, we're going to define some terms because they are used in cash flow analysis. So we'll get the terms out, at which, which is going to be in this section, uh, project cash flows, the first look, and incremental cash flow before we look at our first pro forma financial statement. So what do we need to know? What do we need to know? Here's what the, that's the first thing we need to know. Basically, the concept. The concept is this. The company will undertake a project only if that project adds value. So you only undertake a project, obviously, if that project adds value to the company. Now, how do we define if a project add value? Well, a project add value if it has, if it increases cash flow. So if the cash flow goes up, what do we assume? We assume that the project add cash value. So now, so really what's relevant to any project is the cash flow. Is that's the most important. And we, we, we would talk about later on, cash flow has to be after tax, but we'll talk about this shortly. So the cash flow has to be after tax. After we pay the taxes, how much is left? Okay. So a relevant cash flow for a project is a change in the firm's overall future cash flow that comes as a direct consequence of the decision to take this project. And what's going to happen, any cash flow that's going to increase the project cash flow, that's going to be relevant to us, and that's going to add value to the company. Okay. Because the relevant cash flow are defined in terms of changes in or increment to the firm existing cash flow. They are called incremental cash flow. So any cash flow that's going to add to the value of the company, it's going to add to the existing cash flow. It's going to be called incremental cash flow. Okay. So simply put, the incremental cash flow for a project evaluation consists of any and all changes in the firm future cash flow that are a direct consequence of taking the project. That's basically what it is. This is the incremental cash flow. Simply put, any cash flow that exists regardless of whether or not the project is undertaking is not relevant. So if, the ca if, if a certain cash flow exists, regardless if we take the project or not, we ignore it. So that cash flow will be ignored if it's gonna exist regardless, we ignore it. Now, there's another term we need to be aware of is the standalone, because remember, the definition of incremental cash flow, it says cash flow for a project evaluation consists of any and all changes in the firm future cash flow that are a direct consequence. So if you really think about it, it's sometimes in a very large corporation, it's very hard to analyze all the future cash flow for the whole firm. So what do we need to do? We need to use what's called the standalone principle. So it will be cumbersome to actually calculate the future total cash flow for the firm with and without the project because it will be a lot of work if it's a, if it's a large firm. So what do we do? We isolate that project. So fortunately, it's not really necessary to do so. Once we identify the effect of undertaking the proposed project on the firm's cash flow, we need to focus only on the incremental cash flow from that project. So this is called the standalone principle. So the standalone principle basically state, once you ad identify a project, only analyze the incremental cash flow from that project. So the key is we only need to analyze the cash flow that directly affect that project, directly affect that project. So this is what the standalone principle is. What the standalone principle says is that once we have determined the incremental cash flow from an undertaking a project, we can view that project as a kind of a mini firm with its own future revenues and costs, with its own assets, and of course, with its own, with its own cash flow. So basically, treat the project as, its, as it is its own firm. Therefore, you analyze it separately. Okay? So the, the next thing we're going to look at is few terms we need to be get out of the way. For example, we need to know what is a sunk cost. So we need to define new terms that when we're analyzing a cash flow project, we need to see if we need to include those terms or not include them. The first term we need to look at is something called sunk cost. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the answer first. We ignore sunk cost and we're going to, we're going to explain what sunk cost is. We ignore a sunk cost when we're doing cash flow evaluation, cash flow analysis. Okay. What is sunk cost? Sunk cost is a cost that already have been paid or already have incurred or we have to pay it. 
So basically, a cost that happened in the past. Such costs cannot be changed by the decision today to accept or reject the project. So this, this cost, regardless, if we accept the project or not accept the project, it's irrelevant to us. And remember, we only look at what? We only look at relevant, relevant things. So some cost is considered irrelevant. Put another way, a firm will have to pay for this cost no matter what. If we have to pay for that cost no matter what, if we do or not undertake the project, it's a sunk cost. Based on our general definition of incremental cash flow, such cost is clearly not relevant to the decision at hand. So sunk cost, simply put, not relevant. We only, we only look at the relevant cost. So that a sunk cost is not relevant seems obvious given our discussion. Nonetheless, it's easy to fail prey for the fallacy that a sunk cost should be associated with the project. So let's take a look at a simple example, hopefully it would illustrate the point. Suppose that a general milk company hires a financial consultant to help evaluate whether a line of chocolate milk should be launched. So they hire the consultant. When the consultant turns in the report, general mills object, object to the analysis because the consultant did not include the hefty consulting fee as a cost of the chocolate milk project. So they said, well, your report is no good. Why it's no good? We rejected it because you did not include your fee. Well, guess what? The fee for the consultant is not relevant. Why it's not relevant? Because you have to pay it regardless if you undertake the new chocolate milk line or not undertake this new chocolate milk line. Therefore, the fee is irrelevant, which is considered what? Irrelevant means it's a sunk cost. So who's correct? By now, we should know that the consulting fee is a sunk cost. Sunk cost is irrelevant. It must be paid whether or not we accepted the chocolate milk line. So this is what a sunk cost is. Another term we need to define when we're doing cash flow is something called opportunity cost. So real quick, let me tell you, Opportunity cost, it's going to be relevant for us. So opportunity cost will be relevant. So let's talk about opportunity cost. When we think of cost, we normally think out-of-pocket costs, namely those are required us to actually spend some amount of cash. This is what we think of cost. But there's also something called an opportunity cost. An opportunity co cost is slightly different. What is an opportunity cost? It with opportunity cost, it requires us to give up a benefit. So what benefit are we giving up for undertaking such a project? A common situation arises in which a firm already owns some of the assets a proposed project will be using. So we, we already have the asset. For example, we might be thinking of a converting an old rustic cotton mill we bought years ago for 100000 and converted into a condominium. Okay, so if we undertake this project, there will, be, there will be no direct cash outflow associated with buying the old mill because we already own it, obviously because we have the mill. For purposes of evaluating the condo, should we then treat the mill as free? The answer is we don't treat the mill as free. The mill is a valuable resource for us, okay? If we didn't use it here, we would be doing something else with it. So the obvious answer is we could sell it. So what is the opportunity cost that we are, that we are basically we are given up for converting this mill is we could sell this mill or we could use it for uh, for the new condominium project. So if we if we don't sell it, we're given up that cost. So using the mill has an opportunity cost. We gave up the opportunity to do something else with the mill, which is we said at minimum we can sell it. So this is the opportunity cost that we are giving if we don't sell the, if we use it for the condominium. Okay. There's another issue here. Once we agree that the use of the mill has an opportunity cost, how much we charge the condo project for this use? So what is how much we should include? Given that we paid 100,000, it might be it might seem that we should charge this amount to the condo project. Is that correct? And the answer hopefully you know it's no because the 100,000 we already should know by now. It's called a sunk cost. What we paid for this a mill a few years ago, it's irrelevant to us now. Okay, the fact that we paid 100,000 is irrelevant. That is sunk cost. At minimum, the opportunity cost that we charge for the project is what we could sell it for today, which is the net selling price minus any cost. Because, because this is the amount we gave up by using the mill instead of selling it. So the opportunity cost is how much can we sell it today, net selling? How much can we get for this mill today? And this is the opportunity cost, not how much we pay for it few years ago when we purchased the mill. Another thing we have to be aware of when we're doing cash flow analysis is something called erosion 
or spillover effect, which is which which are called side effect. And we have two types of side effect. Basically, we have a negative side effect in a sense negative, and one is called spillover, spillover effect, which is positive. And for the erosion, I would like to give you a quick example of the erosion you might all be familiar with. For example, Apple Computers sells iPhone, iPods. Okay, so what happened is before they had the iPod included in the iPhone, what happened, Apple was selling a lot of iPods sold separately. Then what happened when the iPhone started to include the iPod, what happened to the sales of the uh, sales of the iPod? It went down. It started to slow, it started to go flat, then it started to go down. So what happened, we had an erosion. The iPhone sales eroded the iPod sales. Basically, it ate it up. So this is basically kind of a negative effect, a negative effect, okay? So in accounting for erosion, it's important to recognize that any sales lost as a result of launching a new product might be lost anyway because of the future competition. But also think about it, another, for example, the uh, the competitors for, uh, uh, for Apple started to include uh, uh, something similar to the iPod. So regardless, we'll, Apple was going to lose this, but the point is Apple ate up its own product, okay? Remember, er erosion is not rel is relevant only when the sales would not otherwise be lost. So when, when do we take into account erosion? Only if the sale would not otherwise be lost, okay? Now, sometimes there is a spillover. Let's look at another erosion example. Um, for example, one of Walt Disney's company's concern when it built Euro Disney, which is Euro Disney, which is located in Paris, was the new park would drain visitors from from the Florida park. So basically, the, the European used to come to Florida to visit Disney. Now, if we have Euro Disney, then they don't they don't go to Florida anymore. Therefore, what's going to happen? The Euro Disney is eroding the sales in Florida. So this is what's called the kind of a negative side effect. But there's also what's called the spillover, which is beneficial side effect. For example, you might think that Hewlett Packard would have been concerned when the price of the printer that sold for 500 to 600 in 1994 declined to below 100 by 2014. So what happened? The selling of the printer went down, went down substantially from 500 to 600 to 100 dollar. But Hewlett Packard did not really care because what wanted the Hewlett, what, what Hewlett Packard wanted to do wanted to sell the supplies, the consumable supplies that goes with the printer, such as inkjet cartridges, laser toner cartridges, and special papers. So what they said, they said, well, guess what's going to happen? We're going to reduce the price, but that's not that's not a big deal because reducing the price will have a spillover effect. What is the spillover effect? More people will buy the printer, and if they buy the printer, if they think it's, it's, it's not expensive, it's a good investment, what are we going to make our money? We're going to make our money on the supplies, the consumable that goes into that printer, such as inkjet cartridges, laser toner, and special paper. So that's another thing we need to be aware of. Basically terms we need to be aware of, um, erosion and the spillover effect. Networking capital, what's networking capital? Networking capital by definition is current assets minus current liabilities. We already talked about this in the past, equal NWC, equal to NWC networking capital. Why do we have to take into account networking capital when, we, when we're doing cash flow analysis? Because every time we undertake a project, we need inventory, we need receivable, okay? And inventory, it's going to have accounts payable, so we're going to need to have accounts payable. So remember, when we undertake a project, we're going to need more current assets and current liabilities, okay? So we're, we're going to need more. And if you think about it, once the project has ended, we're going to need less of those. So we're going to sell any assets left, pay off any liability. So networking capital, at the beginning, it's going to have a negative cash effect. Normally, a project would require that the firm invest in networking capital in addition to long-term asset. A project will generally need some amount of cash on hand to pay for expenses. In addition, a project will need initial investment in inventory and receivable. And some of the financing 
and some of the financing for this will be in the form of amount owed to supplier accounts payable. But the firm will have to supply the balance, of course. This balance represents the investment in networking capital. So once you undertake a project, you may need networking capital. But also remember, once the project has ended, what's going to happen? Inventories are sold, receivables are collected, bills are paid, and the cash balance can be drawn down. So at the end of the project, you're going to have some maybe some some cash back. These activities free up the networking capital originally invested. So the firm's investment in project networking capital closely resembles a loan. The firm supplies working capital at the beginning of the project. So at the beginning at the beginning of the project, networking capital should be negative and recovers it at the end of the project. At the end of the project, networking capital should be positive if anything left. So remember we need to take into account networking capital. Few other things that we have to be aware of when we are doing cash flow analysis is financing cost. Is financing cost. And what is financing cost? Is how are we how are we raising cash for the project? How are we raising cash for the project? And analyzing a proposed investment, we will not include interest paid or any other financing costs such as dividend or principal repaid because we're only interested in the cash flow generated for the asset of the project. Simply put, financing cost is ignored. For, it's not totally ignored, it's ignored for, for the purpose of the project because financing cost is a finance cost, not operating cost. Remember what we're looking is operating the business, not how we finance the business. So more generally, our goal in project evaluation is to compare cash flow from a project to the cost of acquiring that project in order to estimate net present value. Now, how do we finance the project? The mixture of debt and equity actually chooses the firm actually chooses to use to, and financing the project is a managerial variable and primarily determine how project cash flow is divided between owners and creditors. Okay, so remember how you finance the project is not relevant for the project itself because it's a managerial decision that that's, they decide on how they want to finance the project. That's not to say that financing arrangements are unimportant. They're just something to be analyzed separately, which is called the financing cost. So financing cost is not relevant to operating cost, which will cover financing cost later on. Other issues when we are dealing with with the with cash flow analysis is the after tax effect. So we always have to take into account the taxes. Why? Because remember, we have to pay taxes on the profit, and taxes is paid in cash. So that's relevant for us. There are some other things to watch out for. First, we're interested only in measuring cash flow. We're interested in measuring measuring it when it's actually occurred, not when it accrues in accounting sense. So the first thing is we have, we are looking at cash flow, not accrual. Accrual is accounting. Second, we are actually interested in the after-tax cash flow because taxes are definitely a cash outflow. And shortly, we will, we will, we will, we will calculate how after-tax cash flow is calculated. We, we, we'll see how to do this shortly. In fact, whenever we write incremental cash flow, we mean after-tax incremental cash flow, of course, because taxes is actually paid in cash. Remember, however, that after-tax cash flow and accounting profit or net income are entirely different things. So when we, when we say after-tax cash flow, that's totally different than accounting profit or net income, which are accounting or net income, which are gap numbers. If you're in the US, that's those are gap figures. Okay? Versus after cash after tax cash flow is actual after tax cash flow, actual cash. Okay? So just we, we I needed to define those terms and the reason we needed to define them because the next thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at actual pro forma financial statement and project cash flows. Now we're gonna get into an example seeing how this cash flow projects actually work, the mechanics of it. If you have any questions, by all means, email me.